Hi, and welcome to Bright Minds from Tickmill. I'm your host, Patrick Munnerly, and in this series, we're setting out to answer some of the most commonly asked questions around investments and trading through entertaining and insightful conversations with seasoned insiders. We all like to think that we are rational actors and that our decisions are fact-based, made with cool heads and free from outside influence. However, the fascinating field of behavioural finance tells us a different story. By studying the effects of cognitive biases, such as loss aversion, herding and noise trading, researchers have shown that our subconscious underlying assumptions about how the world works are often wildly inaccurate. Recent research by Dalbar, a leading research company, suggests that the effects of cognitive biases can have a negative impact on portfolio performance of up to 3%. Behavioural finance builds on the groundbreaking work of behavioural economists Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, whose work on loss aversion, heuristics, cognitive biases and priming, among many other phenomena, was summarised in the book Thinking Fast and Slow. By applying the findings of behavioural economics to our own decision making in the markets, we can start to recognise and understand how our own cognitive biases, which can help us overcome bad decision making and give us a better chance of trading success. Our guest today is behavioural economics expert Paul Craven. Paul has over 30 years of sales and marketing experience with Schroders, PIMCO and Goldman Sachs. And he travels the world delivering talks and training to organisations such as Facebook, Lloyds and BlackRock, among many others. Paul is also a member of the Magic Circle and as a result has a unique perspective on the tricks our minds can play. We'll be talking about some of the most common biases that affect investment performance, how to spot them in our own behaviour and ways to overcome them. We'll also be discussing how flawed thinking affects the market at large. Paul, thanks so much for joining us today. Could you get things started by telling us a bit more about your career so far? Well, I started in the city in 86 and I worked for Schroeder's for 17 years. And that was an amazing 17 years in many ways, not least because it was a great firm uh, and still is. Um, But of course, in terms of what the markets were doing over that period, we had a a 20-year bull market in the 80s and 90s. We had the tech boom. And then we had uh, the crash afterwards. So that was quite a, a first half of my career um, <laughs> in terms of what I witnessed and what I saw. And I think it was then that I began to get interested in behavioural science or behavioural finance, largely because of, of, of what the markets and the economists were doing and realising that people weren't quite as rational and as efficient and as evidence-based uh, as the classical economics textbooks said they should be. And that's really where my interest first was sparked. Uh, I then was lucky enough to spend a few very happy years at PIMCO. Uh, people were, didn't know much about fixed income in the UK pensions market in those days. They certainly had some, but it wasn't really top of their priority list until the regulations started to change. Uh, and that was a great four years there where um, uh, I, I did my, I played a part as a small cog in the wheel to, to help put PIMCO on the map in the UK. Uh, and then I was uh, fortunate enough to move to Goldman Sachs Asset Management in 2007. Uh, where I uh, started off as head of UK institutional sales and ended up uh, looking after the European business there uh, until the beginning of 2014. And really over that period, I mean, we've seen so many market cycles, we've seen booms and busts, we've seen so many exciting things and and desperately difficult situations, not least the global financial crisis, that um, I came away from all that, Patrick, uh, thinking, what can I do now? And and my first love has always been behavioural finance. And so I've the last seven, year, eight years, I've been waving the flag for that, really trying to explain to people how to use it, both in, in two or three ways, really. One is in terms of investment policy. And you've already said, you know, looking at, looking at oneself, being self-aware of one's own biases. Uh, secondly, uh, how can we make better decisions w- within groups? And finally, how can we be more better at communicating, better at persuading, better at influencing. So those are really the three parts to my behavioural science flag waving. At an institutional level, do you see behavioural finance being a uh, an ethos or a practice that is pushed far more heavily now? Or is it is it still something that's considered more on the, the periphery of, of, of institutions? Oh, I think it's getting taken much more seriously than it was 
when I first than when I first started looking at it. And I think when I first started getting interested in the whole topic, which I would say was probably in the early two thousands, when uh, Kahneman got given his Nobel Prize for economics. Sure. Um, uh, and that's really when I first started becoming aware of it properly in terms of the financial markets. But in those days, if people started thinking about or talking about it, the typical question I'd receive was, well, how do you monetize it? You know, is there a product yeah. that we can design? And some people said, you know, you want to be a quant investor because that takes out a lot of human decision making. Others said, no, 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 no. You want to go the kind of Ben Graham, Warren Buffett, sort of more of a value oriented approach. And it was very sure. product driven. Where I think it's got much more sophisticated and intelligent in the last few years is people saying, well, let's not necessarily try and design a product. Let's just try and improve investors' own behavior. So I'm, for example, working with a, a very exciting group at the moment called Behavior Lab who are analyzing data, looking at how asset managers, uh, whether they hold onto stocks for too long, whether they sell them too early. So it's not trying to tell them how to, 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 to manage money or how to value a stock or bond. It's about when you've decided what you want to buy, how do you hold it? How do you sell it? How do you buy more? And are there patterns in your behavior that come from your biases that if we can analyze and, and, and prove they're, they're causing underperformance, what can we do to improve them? And it's, it's a very exciting field, I think. And it's one that um, I, I think is, is the way forward for behavioral finance. What are some of the most prominent cognitive biases that affect traders or asset managers and some of the practical ways of, of overcoming some of the most common biases? The endowment effect, the idea being that I own something and therefore I like it more, I value it more. Um, I was talking to a, a, an American friend of mine once many years ago uh, called Charlie Ogle, and he came up with a, a line that I've never forgotten. He said, he says, smart cowboys don't fall in love with their horses. <laughs> I, I think that's so clever when you, if you watch too many Westerns as, as I do. But, <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, but of course, in financial terms, what that means is, you know, don't fall in love with your stock. You, sure, you can buy a stock for the long term, but that's not what I'm arguing against. I'm arguing against someone buying something it goes up very quickly. And then people find more reasons to stay fully invested or buy some more. Now, again, that might be the right decision for any any number sure. of periods. But the danger is, and I've seen this a number of times, is people just end up saying, I can never sell this stock. I love it so much. And of yeah. course, you can have a great time on that on the lovely <laughs> bull market rides. And um, and then it all finishes. And who was it? Oh, that's that slightly politically incorrect phrase that, that Barton Briggs came out with those years ago, you know, bull markets are like sex. They feel best just before the end. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so I've learned the tone already, but it w wasn't my comment. <laughs> but um, that, that would be one bias um, that I've certainly identified. And again, looking at the data, looking at someone's data over say three yeah. or five years, you start to spot that pretty quickly. Sure. And uh, it can be very helpful to have nudges to remind you of your behavior because you don't want to end up you don't end up on the impecunious side of uh, of the balance sheet. I think the most pernicious bias, though, is probably confirmation bias. And uh, again, just to, yeah. just to refresh people, what that means it means the idea being I've I've come up with my conclusions. I may have made a good case to to buy something, say, a stock, and the fact it's gone down five or ten percent, it, it doesn't make me challenge or question myself. Now, I'm sure people listening will think, well, I would, but but a lot of people don't. They say, no, no, I know I'm right. They almost say the market is wrong and they yeah. they tend to find more reasons why they're right without thinking, well, where could I be wrong? And that that single question, where could I be wrong? Five words. I think that yeah. if I've seen mistakes repeated in my 30 years in the markets, is people don't ask themselves that question. They merely say, give me more reasons why I'm right. And yeah. now here's yeah. the interesting thing, though. It sounds like you're not confident. Or it's, and of course, our industry, you know, sort of thrives on people who are confident. You can't really go up to your boss and say, look, I've got this really good idea. Let me tell you where I might be wrong. Because it does, you know, it's not sure. very career enhancing. But actually, that's what people should be doing <laughs> sort of unconsciously. <laughs> because having that sort of you know, a, a plan that says, where could I be wrong? And being able to reassess yeah. your ideas uh, and let's face it, I mean, no one gets the markets right all the time. We kid ourselves. It's, if you get right, markets right just over half, you'll, do, you'll be better than nearly every investor out there or most investors out yeah. there. Um, yeah. So um, it's a, a confirmation bias is pernicious. And do you think it's possible to ever, to, for, for 
an investor or even just a, the average person really to to fully overcome biases or is it more a a recognition and acceptance process that you can recognize the behavior coming from the bias to take your question to fully overcome no because we're human and and unfortunately yeah. Or actually, I would say, fortunately, um, human nature doesn't allow us to be to become totally machine-like. We're not all GPT-4 in our thinking, and, and <laughs> thankfully, in, in many ways. However, we we could improve uh, a lot of the ways we do manage money, for example. And I think you've again, you touched on it in your question: is is just being self-aware that you and I yeah. and our fellow listeners all have biases just makes them slightly less dangerous. That, that's where I would start. Self-awareness. Know thyself, in the words of the Delphi or- Oracle. Uh, and yeah. so how do you get to know yourself? Well, I mentioned one way earlier, looking at your own data, trying to understand your patterns of trading. Do you do certain things at certain times? The sort of science or even the neuroscience in this now is fantastic. You know, people have, people are wired up in trading rooms or wired up sometimes to look at their, their hormones their the, the brain patterns and things to see how they react under stress uh, and particularly yeah. how you react under stress is a really important way of, of understanding when your biases really begin to manifest themselves. And again, just talking, going back to a point earlier about people being overconfident and overconfidence can become arrogance. Here's a thing that I've, I've yeah. noticed in, in my 30 years, taught to me many years ago, but I've seen it in action. Sometimes your, your, your biggest strengths become your biggest weaknesses when you have them in excess. So we yeah. like people that are that are confident and, and forward thinking and progressive and able to express their views. But actually people who are overly confident become arrogant and therefore almost don't listen to anyone else's views. And it's true of most yeah. virtues. Most virtues in excess become a vice, certainly in in terms of behavioral science. And um so just be aware. And I think there's sort of another piece of advice I'll give is when you get it right a few times in a row, as um, as many investors do, hopefully that's a that's a function of your skill, and indeed you'll have evidence yeah. to, to prove it's your skill. However, I would just remind everybody that sometimes you can be lucky. It may not be the process that's good. It may be luck, and and ultimately sure. we all want to be as investors skillful and lucky. Now, you can yeah. be skillful and unlucky, and there's no doubt about it. I've seen really good investors suffer periods of terrible performance for, you know, one, two, three, four years sometimes, just because almost they're unlucky. Almost. Yeah. Um, but the skillful ones reassess, reevaluate, uh, and then come back even stronger. They learn from their mistakes, if you like. Uh, it's the ones who are unskillful, who happen to have some luck in the markets, the right sector at the right time through no skill of their own or something. Those are the ones to watch out for because their luck will run out. But just remember when, you know, when uh, when the travellers on the road get wealthier, so do the highwaymen. And we've got to spot the highwaymen yeah. from the, <laughs> the, the bona fide travellers. Yeah, I mean, and I, and I guess that it becomes um, very true and, and most prevalent in market bubbles. Definitely. I mean, talking about, I mean, Mark, I, I'm a, I did history at Cambridge uh, about 2000 years ago. And so I've always had this <laughs> lo- love of, um, uh, of looking back at the old days, whether it be 10 years ago or 100 years ago or, or further. Sure. And obviously, we now have quite a lot of data on financial markets that goes back to certainly the mid 19th century in many cases. And we have market prices for lots of things that go back a lot further. But in terms of sort of stock markets, uh, and I've I've always had an interest in studying booms and busts, if you like, or bubbles and crashes. And yeah. there's been some good work on it over the years. Uh, Charles Kindleberger wrote a good book. But if your listeners want a, a really interesting book to read that only came out last year, which I've been advocating everyone in the marketplace should read, it's a book called um, Boom and Bust by William Quinn and John Turner. And nice. what they've done is gone back and looked at about – a dozen or so bubbles going back to 1720, but they do things like the mining stocks in the 1820s. They do the Australian land bubble in the late 1880s. They do the US stock market in the 20s, the Japanese bubble in the the 80s, um, and the dot-com bubble. And what they've done is yeah. they've come up with something that I think is fascinating. I mean, really, really interesting, whether you're interested in, in stock markets, whether you're interested in history, whether you're really interested in behavioral science. And it's a very, very accessible book, but it's very readable. Every chapter is it's easy to read. It's not an academic book at all, even though it's written by two sure. academics. They said the concept of bubble is wrong. 
because a, a bubble just gives this impression of something sort of just blowing, blowing, getting bigger and bigger and then just popping. And they question that for a number of reasons, not least because they go back and they look at some of their bubbles in history and say, actually, the assumption is that all bubbles are always bad. And actually, there's plenty of bubbles in history, and they, they, they talk about it, where lots of good have come out of it. Um, sure. But there are some really, really bad ones. And we indeed, we've lived through some in, in the last uh, th three decades. But what I like most of all about them saying why this bubble concept is not helpful, they say it's more like a fire, not a bubble. Right. So, so forget the word bubble now. I'll try, and, I'll try not to use it myself, but I'll fail. Um, to have a fire, you need three things. You need fuel, oxygen, and heat. And they look at these three different components in terms of the real fire and take this metaphor and say, well, what are the financial market equivalents? So the fuel, for example, which is behind almost every single bubble, is things like loose money, ease of credit, yeah. low interest rates, that sort of environment, right? Now, again, yeah. look at all the, the B words, look at all the those stock market yeah. booms, right? That fuel is yeah. there. You need yeah. oxygen. Now, what does that mean? You need marketability. So people need to be able to access whatever is the latest exciting idea, whether it be bicycles um, in the 1890s or tech stocks in the late 1990s. Uh, how yeah. easy is it for the people to, 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 to purchase it? How tradable is it? And, and then finally, the third ingredient of the fire is heat, which is what you and I would call speculation. You know, will yeah. can amateurs, novices get hold of it? Because again, a function of most of these stock market booms is, is that people are buying who probably wouldn't be considered uh, professionals who, who, who help to, to help to basically heat up all the budget. And so what's the spark sure. that sets it all off? Well, normally it's either some sort of innovation or it's government policy pushing something. Uh, and, right. and, and, and again, I, listen, I don't, it's not my idea. It's, it's Quinn and Turner's, Quinn's and Turner's idea. But they make a very good case if you accept those three, those three ingredients, fuel, oxygen, heat, um, light, and a spark that sets them off. And they go through all these bubbles. Oh, I have to use the word. I try not to use it. They go through all these booms <laughs> in markets. And they point out that all three of these factors are always there. And why right. that's so useful for, for, for us all now, it's the first, I think it's the first major work on this subject that actually allows us to identify or help us identify future stock market booms or booms in any asset class. It's not necessarily stock markets because we look for sure. these three ingredients and we say, are they all there? And, and their, their argument, again, beautifully argued, beautifully written, easy to understand by the layperson, uh, sets these out. So I've been advocate. So I've gone on a bit too long, but I'm sounds like I've got a commission in this book, but I haven't, but it's a really interesting <laughs> way of looking at behavioral biases, uh, behavioral biases, something I, I love about and stock market booms and busts and trying to, trying to sort of quantify and, and analyze what's going on. And I think it does highlight the importance of a looking at the data and B remembering that we're all, you know, emotional animals, you know, there was the, that Jonathan Haidt phrase, the emotional tail wags the rational dog. <laughs> and I guess that, that leads into um, another, another area which is obviously in the headlines um, of late is the, you know, obviously the rise of artificial intelligence and robo advisors. And what do you, do you think there's a, a, a role for them to play in the field of behavioral finance, i.e. does using machine learning help eliminate bias or, or, or is that achievable on the premise that most of this stuff is designed by human beings in the first place anyway? I'm not an expert in AI. I've been playing around with GPT-4 quite a lot in the last uh, few week, few weeks. Uh, normally, asking it to do sillier things like rewrite <laughs> Shakespeare in the style of Bob Dylan or something. But um, in all seriousness, will 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 machines and machine learning help us overcome human biases in investment? <laughs> Listen, I'm sure there will be people out there saying, of course it will in time, and, and I have no reason to, to, to doubt them uh, in terms of the, the way the technology is improving. But I do believe, and this may be wishful thinking, this may be my own biases in play here. When I talk to people who play chess at a very, very serious senior level, they tell me the following things. The machine will beat a human being. The best machine will beat the best human beings. However... Yeah. The combination of a human being and a machine will beat the best machine. 
So right. if that's true, and if that carries over that simple argument, isn't it? it may be too simple. But I, I retain my faith in the ability of, of human beings to make good decisions for the benefit of, in, in this case, investment or chess or whatever it may be. Excellent. Um, and just, I just want to uh, roll back to to one uh, one aspect of your of the introduction that I don't think I have given due due care and attention to, and that's what's the uh, connection in your mind between behavioural finance and the magic circle? <laughs> yeah, it, for me, they meet around the back of the uh, back of the circle in my head. Um, <laughs> let me let me just tell you why, because. For me, behavioural finance or behavioural science or behavioural economics is all about understanding how we do and don't think particularly well and and what we get right, what we get wrong. When is our intuition absolutely wonderful and when do we um, have perfectly good mental shortcuts that we then apply in the wrong environment so they look irrational? Uh, that to me is what how real people make real decisions in the real world. That's my favourite homegrown definition of behavioral science. Why do I love magic? Because magic actually um, exploits the fact that the mind does and doesn't work well. And um, first of all, I should say one thing very quickly, because um, I have a friends who say, well, the trouble is that magic's deceptive. And I say, no, no, it's an honest contract between performer and spectator. The ma- magician has a sort of unwritten contract. I will fool you. I will try and show you something that will amaze you, give you sort of sense of wonder. Yeah. And that's that's our agreement, right? And if he or she does a good job, they uh, they will get the applause or the, dare I say, the wide the the the, the wide mouthed open amazement, uh, uh, and which is obviously the idea. So so. What's the link between the two? They're both about how the hu- how the human mind doesn't doesn't work, and and for me, that's yeah. why my my passion, my hobby, my pastime, magic. And I'm you know I'm not a professional magician as such, although I do use it a lot when I try and explain in my talks, for example, at conferences how the mind doesn't doesn't work from an investment point of view. I will use sure. psychological experiments in my talks for the whole audience to see the strange ways their mind can work, even though they think they're logical, rational, evidence-based, analytical, data-driven, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in real life, they can be those things, but they're not always those things. What Kahneman calls distinguishing system one and system two thinking. Excellent. Paul, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, is there anywhere our listeners can go to to follow you online? Well, I, I tweet a lot as at Craven Partners. Um, I've got a website, paulcraven.com, and... I'm about four fifths of the way through finishing the book that I started during COVID, which is really my non-academic take on behavioral science, uh, covers a lot of stuff I've seen in my career, my life, uh, and other people's stories as well, and tries to really explain uh, a little bit more about behavioral science and um, how we can basically become better decision makers, whatever we do. So hopefully that book will be out later this year. Brilliant, Paul. Well, thanks again for your time today and uh, really appreciate the the input around behavioural finance and certainly that link to the magic circle. Thanks again, Paul. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. 